Con. It has been an amazing weekend so far. Oh, I see we got some Trekkies in the house. Do we have some Trekkies in the house? Wow, I don't know about you, but I am so excited for our next guest. I would also like to give a shout out to Tiltify for powering our main stage. My name is Tiffany Phillips. I've been your host for this amazing, fun-filled weekend of Comic-Con, and we are on day three. Now, are you ready to go where no audience has ever gone before? I'll so rephrase that. Are you ready to boldly go where no audience has ever gone before? Well, set your phasers to fun. Get ready, everybody. It is time to bring out the greatest actor of our generation. But before I do that, let's bring out his moderators. From Legion M, we have David Baxter, Jeff Anderson, and Paul Scanlon. Give it up for your moderators. Let's get this party started. Hi, LA Comic Con. My God, look at this, all these people. So, why are we on this stage when the only person you really want to see is William Shatner? Uh, I will explain. Um, we are Legion M, a fan-owned film company. We are making a uh, documentary with Bill called You Can Call Me Bill. And uh, we want to tell you a little bit about us and then we will bring out the man. Uh, cue the video. Okay, straight down the barrel. And three, two, Hi, Legion M. Legion M is the world's first fan-owned entertainment company. What we're doing with Legion M has never been possible before. We believe an entertainment company that's owned by fans can be even better than one that's owned by Wall Street. So we're producing films, TV series, and VR projects collectively as a community. And when we're successful, to share them. You know, being a part of Legion M, whether you invest or not, being a part of a community that is making a difference in the entertainment industry, Supporting and representing original breakthrough content. The good folks at Legion M are dumb enough to invest in Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Legion M is owned by 35,000 investors. Just knowing that this film has the support of that many people is so inspiring. I love having you as producing partners on Arch Enemy. Thank you for bringing the fans what they need. Long live Legion M. You know you're watching something that's going to change the course of history. Legion M is an amazing company. It's owned 100% by the fans. I love that Legion M brings fans together. Legion M, great people, great cause, great organization. Legion M, we count on you. We depend on you. We need you. Keep it going. It's true. We are uniting a vibrant, engaged community to co-own the company, have a voice in what content we produce, go behind the scenes and get involved, but also own a piece of the upside. We're redefining what it means to be a shareholder. You don't even have to invest. Just become a member and you'll see what it's all about. It's a novel way of making films, and that's the other thing that appealed to me. Not only the people behind it, but the concept is really remarkable. Paul and I have done this before. 20 years ago, we started a company that revolutionized television by being the first company to put live television on a cell phone. Today, we think Legion M has the potential to be even bigger. What it is that you guys do that's so special is you connect with fans. And that, that's meaningful for filmmakers and for films to be able to find an audience. I'm honored to be a part of that. I think that's so motivating. We've already released several movies for fans as our guiding light. And our pipeline of projects is bigger and better than it's ever been. Our long-term goal is to unite one million fans as shareholders of Legion. That's not a small company in Hollywood. That is one of the most influential companies on the planet. It's an amazingly fun process to open the gates of Hollywood and allow people to come in. And if you believe in the power of fans and a fan-owned company, we want you to come join the Legion. There's a sense of ownership because you do own it. It's the concept of its time. Join the Legion! Join the Legion! Join the Legion! Join the Legion! Join the Legion. Ah! So everybody, that's Legion M, and um, I would just like to say, um, you may have heard of this newcomer, a lot of people think he's going to really do some interesting things in the future, Mr. William Shatner.
Thank you so much. Gosh, it's good to see you. Uh, Legionnaire, it's, it, 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 it's an um, interesting company. Let me, let me tell you a story. <laughs> and it'll take about a half hour. <laughs> I did an album when I was um, shooting, um, I guess, Star Trek, I believe it. Um, and a company came up to me and said, when I do an album, I feel so removed from the audience. So uh, they, they said, would you do an album? So I did an album, and it was called The Transform Man. And um, what I thought would be interesting was uh, to have a, a concept, uh, a, a literary element to the album. Uh, and do speeches from uh, to be or not to be, to be not to be uh, Hamlet, and that would segue into a song like um, uh, it was a very good year, and then that song, the songs of that time. So I did uh, something from uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, and one of the speeches ends. I may climb to no great heights, but I will climb alone. And then I segue musically into a drug song which you can't climb alone because you need the drugs. You I thought it was really good. So now I'm on the Don, uh, Johnny Carson show and, uh, and the record is, uh, I love the word, the, the record is dropped. And, and, so the, uh, and, I, uh, and I'm doing publicity and I'm on the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson. And I'm in rehearsal, and I do, uh, I make climb to no great height, I roll, climb along, and say, when saw uh, Lucy in the sky with diamonds coming. And the producer comes up to me and says, hey, that's six minutes long. You can only do three minutes. Do you want to do the, the literary thing, or do you want to do the song? I go, oh, I don't know. I'll do the song. So now, I'm in front of millions of people, and I'm doing, Lucy in the sky with diamonds. I'm doing what I did. I look over at Johnny Carson, and he's going... <laughs> <laughs> so the record died. I mean, it was laughter. So, years later, Ben Folds, yes, Ben Folds, hears it. He doesn't need applause now. He? <laughs> he's like a genius. And he hears it, and he calls me, and I like to work with him, I work with him, I do it, and now, and now I'm back in the music uh, career. And I can't sing. That's the thing. I, I, I can't sing. It was terrible. I, but I wanted to make music. But I understand the onomatopoeia of the English language, the rhythm, and the poetry of English. So I began to work with musicians and put out a number of a number of albums. To the point that last year, or this year uh, at the beginning, Ben Folds calls and says, would you like to sing with a 70-piece orchestra at the Kennedy Center? Perfect, because I just had put out an album called Bill, which is out there now. And we had a lot of songs left over because we enjoyed the songwriting process so much. We chose six songs, uh, uh, Robert Cherno, Dan Miller, and I chose six songs to sing, to perform at Kennedy Center. And it went so well that we filmed it and we made an album of it. We've got a television show of it. And there was one song that everybody loved and it was called, we called it So Fragile, So Blue, about this trip I took into space and how I realized, more than ever, dramatically realized what we were doing to the earth. And we wrote a song about it. And it's like a great song. And so Legion M, with whom I had been with, said we would like to do that, we'd like to produce it. The, the documentary of the whole performance uh, of, of the performance at Kennedy Center. Represent the album, and let's make, I forgot, who was it, whose suggestion was it? Let's make a music video of So Fragile, So Blue, and in our fantasy, in our imagination, So Fragile, So Blue will become like a rallying cry the way we are the world 
everybody began to sing because of the cause so fragile, so blue in our fantasy is a rallying cry to help save the world. So here we are, Legion M and, and me. So we're going to, the way that we're going to do this is, is, pretty, is pretty casual. We're going to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Steven Craver, uh, Glickman, Gustavo from uh, Big Time Rush is in the audience. Are you here, Steven? Where are you? I'm Raise right your here. hand. There he is. I'm here. I'm so here. we're gonna, we're going to take a few questions and then uh, we're going to give you a little sample of uh, Bill's upcoming documentary. Uh, you'll also see maybe a little bit of So Fragile, So Blue, and uh, and then uh, we'll take uh, a few more questions. So, Stephen. Yes, sir. Is there somebody near you? There's a fellow Something right here. to say to William Shatner. All right, you got one. Hello, William. I want to ask, uh, after all these years, what right. do uh, right. Oh, there you are. Okay, start again. Uh, I gotta ask, uh, how, what do uh, Trekkies mean to you? Uh, what makes them special from other fandoms, the Star Trek fandom? Wait, wait, wait. It's, it's, I, I, did anybody understand that question? <laughs> <laughs> what do Star Trek fans mean to you? Wait a minute. No, no, no. Just, just, uh, I'm gonna get him to... What, are you an interpreter? I can I, I speak English. <laughs> God. You want to try one more time? Try one more Here time. We go. Uh, what makes uh, Trekkies special to you? Oh, that they're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it's true. I mean, uh, a Trekkie, I hate that term. We, we, uh, those people who were in love with Star Trek and, and watched it, uh, admired the show, well, of which I am one. Um, I got into an argument yesterday about science fiction and the existence of religion. And it was like, there's no, there's no argument, in my mind, there's no argument. Science fiction, of which uh, Star Trek was a great proponent, is our imagination of what exists out there. Obviously nobody knows. So, scientists, <clears throat> who's great scientists like Stephen Hawking, have a theory. Oh, black holes! I think there's black. I think there's things called black holes because uh, 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 Einstein's theory suggests that there are black holes, and I think there are black. And I'm going to find all the information I can to support that thesis, and then they find ways of supporting it. And if they get enough support, then more people believe. And then they begin to believe there are black holes, and then one day we discover there are black holes. We can see them. Stephen Hawking was right. Science fiction writers do the same thing. They take some concept in science, something weird, and write a whole story about it. It's their, it's their thesis. If there were more scientists involved, they might prove whatever that imagination, imaginary the element was prove it true. It could be because so many scientists have written about uh, written science fiction. There's no argument in my mind between religion, the belief in God, and science and science fiction because it's all a miracle. It's all miraculous. The Webb Telescope, looking far out as it is and going to is going to reveal more of the miracles of space and time of which we know nothing. When you think that the universe is coated in what we call dark matter, 90% or 95%, we don't know anything. We don't know what dark matter is and it's, the universe is expanding, it should be contracting according to the laws of gravity, it's not. There's so much that is mysterious. You can call it God, you can call it science, you can call it science fiction. The whole thing is just wondrous because it's, a it's, it's imaginative.
Uh, good. Yourself, Laura? Pretty good. Right into the mic. Put that microphone. There you go. Hi. There you I'm go. pretty good. Um, my question, besides how you work, <laughs> was how was it going up into space? How was it up in space? So, the question is this. Should I go into the detail? Because it was an enormous experience for me. But we have so much material here to say, because when I'm asked a question, I don't have time to really answer it. Exciting, empty, wonderful, wondrous, you know, and then move on to what's for dinner. But a more lengthy answer, uh, a, a briefer uh, answer than what I usually give, but more extensive than exciting, is I read Rachel Carson's book, uh, The Silent Spring, 60 years ago. She was writing about DDT, but had reference to the oncoming tsunami of what we all are facing in terms of global warming. She warned us then, 60 years ago, and I fell under that spell. And I've been an ecologist and, and preaching these things that we all now know a long time ago. And, and so I've been aware of how ominous uh, our condition is in the world. Now I'm up there. And I'm looking through the window and I'm seeing the black of space. And it's not filled with galaxies and twinkling stars and masses of uh, dust starlight. You don't see that from where I was. What you see is nothing. It's black. It's implacable. And it's cold. It's death. I saw death. When I looked back and I saw Earth with its beige desert colors and the whiteness of the clouds and the blue of the, of the air, of the, the, the refractive air, I saw life. And then my next thought was, it's taken 5.8 billion years for all of us and all the things on our beautiful earth to evolve. It's taken all this time for life in all its mystical, magical, numerous forms. I saw film of worms and, and, and uh, and, and, uh, and clams living in 600 degrees Fahrenheit water right at the bottom of the ocean. I know that there are bacteria in, in uh, rocks that come from outer space. There's stuff that's alive in the freeze of, of space. Life is burgeoning everywhere. Life demands to exist. And the life that has demanded to exist here on Earth, filling every crevice, every niche, slime that has intelligence enough to aim for the sun, slime is, a, is, is, is alive. And then you get to what we are supposed to be the highest uh, evolution of life with our wars and our hatreds and our jealousies mixed in with our beautiful desire to know more, to bear witness to the beauty of the universe. And things are going extinct. Things that have evolved for 5.8 billion years are going extinct. And we don't know what they are because we've never seen them. Things, beautiful, sacred things on Earth are disappearing and we don't know what they are. We don't know where they came from. That magical thing that everything exists on earth is magical. And all that magic is disappearing in front of our eyes. That's what I saw in space and that's what I was mourning.
when I came down. And I said, apparently, because I didn't know what I was saying, but I landed, I don't want ever to forget what it is I saw and felt. And I had been talking about this since I landed. It's not that for the first time, it's just dramatically. I saw, I saw this little rock. I saw the outlines of the rock. I could go like that and, and do the circumference of the earth. And then you look out into the vastness of space, unlimited. 13.8 billion years ago, there's a galaxy out there that the Hubble saw. What will the web see going 100 times further? I mean, the universe is limitless. We can't even begin our little reptilian brains to imagine the magic, the mystery of space. That's what I saw when I came down to Earth. Everyone, this is sort of a perfect time uh, to give you a, a little taste of the documentary that we're doing because of the last question. Uh, could you cue that up? The uh, Alexander O. Philippe, uh, our director, is going to give a little message, and he's going to we're going to play a clip. Good evening, Los Angeles, coming on. Alexander Philippe, I'm the director of the upcoming documentary. You can call me Bill. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you guys. I'm currently in Northern Washington State, but I am with you, Spirit, and uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of a taste of what's to come. So, without further ado, there's a scene. We are approaching a very, to put it mildly, a very tough time for the people who come after us. And We've got our heads in the sand, mostly. It's total denial on the global scale because what is reality is so painful that it, you better not face it. I heard an author some years ago say, well, it doesn't bother me because I'm out of here very soon. But what about your love? What are you going to do about that? That's really bothers me. And I thought of all those things as I came down. And I was, I realized now, it took me hours to come to the conclusion I was in grief for the earth. I hope I never recover from what I discovered. Like a long lost lover, I am left to neglect mountains, trees, birds, beasts, life giving water, magnificent feasts, north, south, west, east, all human reactions from terror to fun. All that breathes, swims, flies, or runs, literally everything under the sun. We all have our loves, and what a miracle that is on this planet. And, and everything loves, um, every living thing loves. The percentages of, uh, of the degradation of wildlife on, on, on Earth is enormous. We don't realize it, but it's like, it's like uh, having termites. You know, that's uh, dancing on the floor, and one day you fall through the floor. How did that happen? It's all there. It's all being eaten away. It's all so fragile. What can we do? What can we do? So fragile. So do. Jeff and Paul, would you like to uh, yeah. make some statement about working with Mr. Shatner? Yeah, sure. That's uh, so. What you saw there is not is is some of the footage uh, that we captured, and we're we're, we're working with uh, Alexander Ophelip, who's an amazing, award-winning documentary filmmaker. Um, this all started when we, we, we met Bill and joined, he joined our advisory board probably a little bit over a year ago. And when we had the opportunity to sit down and get a chance to know him, what we realized is that he is so much cooler in person <laughs> than he is on TV. And we wanted to give people a taste of it. So uh, we, 
Bill agreed to do it. We found an amazing documentary filmmaker. One thing that's really interesting about this film is that it will be entirely owned by fans. We're, we're funding it, um, and you can learn more about that on the Legion M website. But it's, it's, I think it's just, it's so powerful um, that Bill really wanted this as a project to be owned by fans. And, you know, what he's saying is, is 100%, every time we're on the phone, every time there's a decision to be made, it's, it's, it's all about the fans, it's all about evangelizing this message, and it's figuring out how we can collectively unite to change the world. Well, it's just that when uh, I met the, the guys, these three gentlemen, they're so bright and so creative. And the concept behind Legion M is, you guys give, you know what crowdfunding is. Well, this is not crowdfunding. This is, you give your money you own a piece of the company. If the, if the documentary or the film that you invest in makes money, you make money. It's, you own it. So it isn't, give us some money and we'll make a film and you'll be happy to see it because you gave your hundred dollars. No, you're part of Legion M. And that's, I thought, what a great concept. The fans become part of the process. So there is the documentary of, of uh, the performance, the album <clears throat> of the performance, and they're making a documentary about me, a biographical documentary. So there's two documentaries and, a, and, a, and an album and a music video as well. Not to confuse you about what you own, which documentary you own. Why don't you clear that up? It's a, it's a biographical documentary. Right That's the mind. first one that we're, we're doing. We're going to be, we're in post-production on it. The scene that you saw is from that from that documentary, and uh, that's the one that fans will own. Fans will be the first in line to get money as we monetize that film, even before William and uh, Legion M uh, take any money from from the project. And then we're gonna we're gonna share the proceeds. Before we get paid, the the investors get paid. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah, we're trying to redefine what it means to be a shareholder and an investor in entertainment. And uh, you know, one thing I want to add, and in, in, in part of our motivation and inspiration is, as you know, as Jeff mentioned, as we got to know Bill, we really were completely and utterly inspired by him. And you know, one of the questions I have, and I and you answered this before, and I think it's so fantastic. I mean, I, I don't know that I believe him. I feel like Bill found the fountain of youth somewhere, and I'm hoping that he shares. Yes, yeah, so I'm crowdfunding the, the, the fountain of youth. <laughs> the fountain of youth. But, but Bill does more in an average day than anyone else I know. I mean, he. what time did you get home last night? After midnight. Uh, well, I got to bed about 1.30. Well. Yeah, 1.30, but he's back here on stage. And, you know, one of the things I've, I've heard you talk about, like, what, what keeps you young and energized? And it's your passion and your curiosity. And, and I'm so unbelievably inspired by that, and I think that that's a big part of what the documentary will reveal as well. Great. Uh, this book I've got out there now, Bold to Go, talks about that, yeah. uh, about the adventures, and the, and the concept that the universe, if you can vibrate in tune with the universe, which I guess is like an ancient philosophy. I thought, I've just discovered something. Vibrate in tune with the unit. Oh, that's what religion is all about. <laughs> that's what mankind has been doing since the dawn of mankind. I just got it. You mean there's fire? Yeah. Ah, oh, I've got fire. Yeah, so that curiosity, that passion for life. We should. I mean, it's magic. Look at us here. We're gathered here in this gigantic hall and we're like all together. <laughs> what? They love you. He's pretending he doesn't hear you. You love me. I love you. But for how long will our affair go on? <laughs> we good? Yeah. So, so we're gonna we're gonna go back.
and take some more questions. Got All right, we got one right here. Uh, tell me your name. All right, Michael, uh, what is your question? Good morning, Mr. Shatner. Right in there, Michael, a little louder. A little louder? All right. Uh, what can we as fans do to get you back in the captain's chair? <laughs> uh, Money. <laughs> uh, no, you know, <clears throat> so I did six movies of our seven, seven. Anyway, they've written my demise, okay, and <clears throat> so I'm dying, Captain Kirk is dying, and I had to live. Um, Captain Kirk, whenever he saw a strange monster, said to go, oh shit, he went, oh, look at that. I mean, I acted like, wow. How strange and wonderful. So as he's dying, I thought, you know, Kirk would look at death and say, wow. And I had lived. Oh my. But it didn't come out quite when I saw it. I had more, in my mind, I had more, my, like, oh, wow, I see now. Apparently, uh, What's his name? The drug guy, the uh, the great Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary takes his life. This is what they said. Timothy Leary took his last breath and said, "Of course. What did he see? What did he see? We don't know." The Steve Jobs, his wife or daughters reported his last word, Steve Jobs, of Apple, invented the telephone, the thing. <laughs> he said, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow, three times. I mean, did he have to go to the bathroom? I don't know. What did he see? So Captain Kirk went, oh my, oh my. What did Captain Kirk see? So. The moment that scene was over, I jumped up and I said to the producer, who was now producing all the Star Trek, okay, I've written a book about him coming back. <laughs> and he said, sorry, Bill, we're putting the uh, next generation cast in because Star Trek cost about $30 million to make and brought in about $100 million, which is very close to that rule of thumb of making three times the amount of money you invest, three times the amount of money the film costs is what you should make to where you begin to show profit. So they would make a limited, Paramount would make a limited amount of money on our, on our, on our films. And invariably, all of the movies that, the, that our uh, cast made made a hundred million dollars. So they thought, well, we'll put the next generation cast in there, and uh, they were, we're paying them a hell of a lot more money than they paid us. And surely their movies would make more than it did. Then J.J. Abrams got a hold of it, and he knew how to make it a big blockbuster, and so his movies made, you know, made hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. He, he knew the secret. Uh, which we thought was all about stories, which was what Star Trek, which was the Star Trek I made, was all about. He was thinking stories and largesse, and that was the answer. So what, what would it take to get me back? How would I come back? I, it was 60 years ago. What happened in that city? I mean, people are like, Jesus, look at I go on stage. They, somebody plays a clip of me as Captain Kirk, and then I come on stage, and I know when I'm in person, the the grandmother says to the grandchild, "Hey, there's Mr. Shatner, there's William Shatner, Captain Kirk," and the kid goes, kids looking around for Captain Kirk. <laughs> how you know how embarrassing that is? When I when the guy said we're going to play a clip, I said I'm not watching. <laughs> I can't stand to look at myself. I mean. You look at old pictures of yourself and think, my God, did I look like that? That's how I feel about looking at myself. So, 
I don't think I could ever come back. But maybe J.J. Abrams can think of a magical thing and I would do it. It's science fiction, right? Yeah, but up to a point. <laughs> There's only so much your imagination can encompass. You mean Captain Kirk looks like that now? <laughs> I don't know, Indiana Jones looks like that. Uh, Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, he's... Yeah, but he's good looking. <laughs> Come on! Yeah, no, but I really mean that. He is, he's a terrific guy. Okay, that's your answer. Maybe ever, never, ever. All right, well, I think you look fantastic. Come on, everybody. You're, you're talking to the chosen few. You know? <laughs> All right, we got a question from Eugene. Eugene, make it a good one. Hello, Mr. Shatner. Hi, Eugene. I was wondering, what was it like to work on the Twilight Zone? Wow. Well, you know, I, I'm constantly amazed. Twilight Zone was made before Star Trek. So what? Like, don't don't even hear this figure. Like 70 years ago, I made a half-hour film, two half-hour films, and miraculously, they live on. Why they live on? I have no idea. I'm looking at myself when I was 25 or something. I don't care what. Why would anybody want to watch me 70 years later? I don't know. But every time they have a marathon of Twilight Zone. So what is it? What, do you guys have an answer as to why people want to see a half hour film uh, of me or anybody for that matter? Well, I mean, it's... What? What, what was that? <laughs> it's because of you. <laughs> yeah. Well, there must be some realistic answer that I don't know. I think it's like... No, I just got off an airplane a few hours ago, and uh, that one went by. That one went by. What was that about the wing? Are you talking? That's what I'm getting to. So every so often, I look out the window. Yeah. me. <laughs> and I look, you know, I'm looking out the window, and I'm looking at the clouds or the sky or the, and I look back over there, and there's something going <laughs> on. <laughs> I used to play that game with my kids. When, I, when they were young enough to accompany me on a trip, I'd, I'd, I'd look out the window. I'd say, "Go get the, go get the, uh, the, the stewardess. Go get the uh, flight attendant. The flight attendant." And my kids would get the flight attendant. I'd say, "Yes, can I help?" And I'd go. <laughs> <laughs> he still got it. <laughs> he still got it. Uh, I think that, that that goes to our universal fear of flying, but. Uh, well, also, you know, you worked with some great science fiction authors. Twilight Zone had a oh, great... Oh, Twilight writer. Zone was a great, great author, which continued to write the science fiction films and then did a lot of Star Trek. They were, that, that's where it's at. The word is always the word. What do you say? What's the plot? What is universally... Uh, what's in our brains that we don't even know? That's what our stories should have been. All right, we have a question over here. Over here, guys, over here, we have a question from Noel. Noel, what is your question? Live long and prosper, Mr. Shatner. Well, I've done one. <laughs> I have a question. What was it like working with uh, T.J. Hooker? <laughs> what was T.J. Hooker like? I love doing T.J. Hooker. I, 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 I love cops. You know, Policemen are getting a bad rap these days, but you've got to admit, <clears throat> their job, which they do invariably, with some remote exceptions, you're running away from whatever it is, their job, and they're human beings, remember, running towards. So, policemen have an incredibly interesting job. They're dealing with people in all their agony, and many policemen that I have worked with and I know are consumed by their job and the, 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 the things they do to help people. All that makes the news, you don't hear about those brave guys, all you hear about are the exceptions to the rule. Cops are really wonderful. I love being, and I, I love taking the tests, and I went to the academy here in, in uh, uh, 
wherever it is, and and uh, somewhere near the baseball stadium. And and uh, I loved being a part of it. It was wonderful. And I went to the range and I shot guns and I did, and and learned the the philosophy. One moment that I see vividly now that I, I, I for some reason has never escaped my brain and because I beat so many people and do a large, large variety of things, I just, everything goes out the window except I'm on stage. Oh yeah, uh, did you remember? No, I, you know, I, I don't remember quite where it was and what I did, but this moment in shooting T.J. Hooker downtown here on a Friday night, we would work, work late Friday nights because you could work as late as you needed to on a Friday night because the unions allowed it. Couldn't work late on a Thursday night because you had to be there at six or seven o'clock Friday morning. But Friday night you couldn't work late because you had Saturday and Sunday off. So now it's late Friday night downtown LA. And in those years, and I presume it's the same now, it's, <clears throat> it's a tricky place to be. You don't want to be there alone. And of course we weren't alone. There's a crowd, not unlike you are here, watching us film. And that time somebody was knifed in the in the people watching. And the police, we had police around us, of course. They were busy solving that out. But so now the the the, the evening was over and I got into a limo. They put a, they give you a limo to take you home. So I'm downtown LA among people who are starving and, and, and around looking for a place to sleep. And I get in a limo. I get in a limo and I'm driving away. <clears throat> and over a street light, so the light is formed a cone like this. And in that cone of light, I see a policeman with his hand resting on his, on his holster. He hasn't drawn the gun, but he's in that pose there. And on the other side of him is a bad guy looking like that. And the two, the, the force of bad and the force for good, it was like a painting. That overhead light of the lamp, of the, uh, of the street lamp. I, I still picture it. Like, who's the artist who painted the lonely people in the cafe? Hopper. Hopper painted that uh, extraordinary Nighthawk. I saw Nighthawk, a Hopper painting, in a different light. And that was T.J. Hooker. I think, I think we've got time. Here we go. It's okay. Do we have time for one more? I think this is it. I think it's All right, here we go. This is Julian. Uh, Julian has a question. Hi, Julian. Right into the mic, dear. <laughs> okay, so I know Star Trek stories are a lot about explorations and about the next generation. Um, me, as a student, me looking at this strange new world, looking into the stats, looking into the society, I feel like I'm sort of lost. I would like to ask Captain, where shall we go? So. Captain, if you have one word to say to the next generation, to the students, what would you say? I would say that's the longest question I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the question? What was the question? Don't be shy. I just had uh, difficulty. The, the question is, what shall, for the students of this next generation yeah. of people, the uh, next, not the next generation show. No. The next generation of, of her generation. Human beings. Okay, yes. got it. Where shall they go uh, any direction from the captain? The future is so profound. What's in store for you is either greatness of the scientists and the burgeoning knowledge and, and the, the desire to learn and the instruments to, to make that happen are happening all around us. The future is incredible for you and your and your and and your youthful compatriots. There's only one thing in the way, and that is global warming. And you, you and your wonderful 
people of your age and generation are left to deal with it. We've kicked the can down the road. We've had this burden, and all that we adults have done have said, um, let's go to the movies. You're facing the music. Once we get past this thing, and what is it? Is it an invention of taking carbon dioxide out of the air? I mean, as simple as, it sounds simple. There's a machine in Norway that does that, but you need extraordinary volumes. But the, but the humanity that have invented this microphone and that telephone can invent anything. Anything you can imagine, we can do. So we can imagine a future with beauty and, 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 and peace, but you have to do it. Once you've done that, mankind is free to do what science fiction offers you in terms of how beautiful the future can be. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for William Shatner.